hello and welcome to this edition of Let's Talk Forensic Psychology. Um, today we're really pleased to be joined by the newly appointed Associate Professor, congratulations Craig, um, in psychology at Nottingham Trent University. Um, Craig's also a blogger on politics, sex and crime, so very light subjects to blog about. Um, and I've seen some of your Twitter interchanges about <laughs> some of your topics. Um, and he's published extensively in the areas of political decision making, the Good Lives Model, um, attitudes towards asexuality and those attitudes towards those who commit sexual offences and more recently on the psych psychological characteristics of those who own sex dolls. Um, so you're very welcome. Um, so I wonder if you could start by telling us a bit about how you got into forensic psychology. I always frame myself as, as kind of a, a little bit of an imposter I guess in, in forensic circles. So I'm not a forensic psychologist, I've never worked in a prison, I've never worked with convicted populations, um, I've gone straight through from my undergraduate to my master's, to my PhD, and now onto academia doing essentially social psychology research, um, just applied to, to crime, really. Um, I first got into it in God, 2011 now, 2010, 2011, when I was doing my undergraduate degree with Todd Hogue at Lincoln. Um, so yeah, I basically did my undergraduate project on attitudes towards uh, people with sexual convictions or attitudes towards sex offenders as they were at that, at that stage, now kind of the language has, has evolved. Um, basically looking at kind of how did students and the general public kind of conceive of this group. Um, and that's just developed over time. So I've done stuff on uh, media representations of, of this group. My PhD was all about how people form attitudes. So we know that people generally have negative attitudes, but we don't really know much about the psychology of that. Um, so I did a lot of work on things like uh, cognitive heuristics and things like that. So how do people actually um, kind of form these attitudes? What are the mental processes that go on to form those attitudes? So can you just yeah. tell us what a cognitive heuristic is? Sure, so uh, heuristics are essentially mental shortcuts. So for example, uh, the availability heuristic, if I said to, to one of you, if you can name your fruit as fast as you can, probably you're gonna say something like apple or banana rather than peach or mango because they're more, available in our kind of cognitive resources, I guess. Um, and that's one kind of example of a heuristic where it's a shortcut in our mind. We use these uh, kind of preconceived rules, predefined rules that we have in our minds to make really quick decisions. So I did stuff on availability, looking particularly around the kind of Jimmy Savile case. Um, so when I was doing my, my master's degree was when the, the Savile case really kind of hit the headlines in 2012, 2013. Um, and we saw basically there was about 350% increase just in the coverage of sexual crime year on year, pre and post that Savile case breaking. Um, that wasn't including the Jimmy Savile articles. If we included them, it would have been much higher as well. Um, so you can see how these really high profile cases and available case kind of drives a, a lot of the kind of social discourse around sexual crime. And you've worked really hard to challenge sort of misrepresentations, I think, in the media. I've seen you challenge quite a lot about um, yeah, how we view things and why we view them that way. That's really um because some on our channel we try to think about um you know how so everyday people could, you know, people that don't work in forensic psychology um could understand some of these attitudes. So it's really interesting to hear you speak about how we might develop those attitudes, for instance, towards people with sexual convictions. And what did you sort of um find from that? So I, I've not really done too much to be honest on changing attitudes towards people with sexual convictions, because I think once people have committed the act, it's going to be quite difficult to, to change people's attitudes towards that, just because the visceral, the emotive kind of response that we have to that kind of offending is so, so powerful. Um, so one thing that we did do was just the final study of my PhD actually was looking at, can we change attitudes towards people with uh, sexual kind of interests in children, sexual attraction to children, kind of in that pre-offense stage. So people who have those sexual, uh, sexual attractions, um, who aren't offending, who maybe won't ever offend, um, but can we change those attitudes? So one thing that we developed was uh, a process called narrative humanization. So it's kind of breaking down that monster stereotype that people have. We have this kind of emotive response, I guess. We see them as, if you look at the media representations, for example, headlines like Beast and Fiend um, are quite often kind of represented, particularly in tabloid newspapers. Um, so what we thought was that because those kinds of headlines are dehumanizing, can we rehumanize by presenting stories of 
people with these sexual attractions talking about what it's like to have them um talking about the barriers that they have to seeking help talking about the difficulties that they have navigating social interaction things like that and what we found was that we could um change people's attitudes or maybe not change people's attitudes so in my phd we did just a single sitting so pre and post watching a video um, we found relatively small effects in that, but significant effects where we could we saw improved attitudes after watching a, a humanizing video. Um, I was then lucky enough to get some funding from NOTA to look at doing this more longitudinally. Um, so instead of looking at it in student samples pre and post on a computer screen in a single session, um, we recruited something in the region of 900 community members. Um, and we showed them the same stimuli, so a five minute video of either somebody who was paedophilic talking about those sexual attractions or a video of, I'm sure you're all aware of James Cantor talking about his work um, on kind of the neuroscience of paedophilia. Basically the same core arguments coming through, but the source of the information was what was different. Um, and we found kind of pre and post in the same sitting, quite big changes in people's attitudes where people were becoming less negative. And then at four months down the line, we saw that those those changes, they weren't quite as big, but they were still there. So we could see even with a five minute intervention, we saw in improvements in people's attitudes towards people with paedophilic sexual attractions, even at four months down the line. So my hope is that we will be able to do something a little bit bigger next time. So can we look at, um, so kind of my blue sky idea, I guess, is can we get a soap to put uh, someone with sexual attractions to children in their, in their storyline? Could that be a storyline? We've seen massive, um, stories in relation to domestic abuse, in relation to uh, racism, in relation to kind of sexuality. Can we do something like that in relation to sexual attraction to children? It's really difficult to convince people to try and do that. But when you think about the prevalence of these kinds of um, attractions, lowest estimates, probably half a percent of men. Um, if you look at the big German studies, then it's anywhere up to kind of 15% of men will say that they fantasized about children. Um, so these are, there's a huge number of people that this could potentially uh, affect. Um, so yeah, if we could get something like that in a soap, that would be the ideal, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. I was wondering if you could, you know, share a little bit about why it's important that we kind of in some ways humanize some of those interests um, and so what has your research found about why that's important and what do we know about that? Um, yeah so I mean a lot of this data comes from work that's being led at, at NCU by Rebecca Leavesley um, looking at kind of how people uh, live with sexual attractions to children and thinking about what it's like in terms of uh, I'm probably going to butcher some of their findings now, but kind of looking at this concealed identity, how people have to hide and kind of wear a mask of, of being someone who isn't attracted to children, trying to pretend like they have um, kind of normal, I guess, sexual attractions, trying to kind of fit in with their, their peer group. We also know from um, a lot of literature that these individuals are trying to seek help but that are quite often the services just aren't there. So if we can improve people's attitudes, make it a little bit more accessible, I guess, make it a little bit more um, acceptable for people to come forward and seek help if that's what they, if that's what they want, um, then that's something that, that I think we should do. And, and instead of having people kind of isolated, potentially ruminating on these sexual attractions, um, living with mental health difficulties that are kind of driven in large part by these sexual attractions, then we should be doing something to help that. Even if it's in a, uh, even if, if it's in the context of, of mental health care, for example, we've done some work recently looking at people who are working in healthcare settings. So GPs, psychologists, mental health workers, CBT therapists, um, around 40% of our GPs in the, in the uh, sample that we recruited couldn't even define what paedophilia was, let alone, um, know what to do in terms of working with someone with those sexual attractions so the more we can educate society but professionals as well um the more available we can make some of these services i think and that's for me that's what's important in terms of can we can we make these services more available to people who feel like they might want to access them mm. that's so important isn't it and then there's projects like the aurora project up in nottingham where people with these interests are able to come forward and talk about them and work through them. Um, because as you say, the majority of people have these interests are never gonna go on to offend, but have this fear of having these interests in these um, 
views. Sure, and I think that some of the the kind of projects that are already available. So Aurora is, is one example. Um, Dunkelfeld as well in Germany, which is kind of the big one, I guess, that people kind of instinctively think about. Um, a lot of the people who are who are kind of accessing these services um, are not coming forward off their own back necessarily. So again, it's about how do we advertise these services so that people who are living in the community can recognize that there are services to go to instead of needing to be referred um, by a GP or a psychologist or uh, by criminal justice kind of workers. So how can we kind of advertise those a little bit better as well? And that's where the, the attitudinal stuff comes in as well in terms of what's the best way to not just change people's attitudes, but to reach these, these individuals directly. How do we actually do that? How do we frame those messages in a way that isn't going to be off-putting to them? What are public attitudes towards the use of sex sales? My instinctive answer to that before we started doing research was that people hate sex dolls and they hate people who own them yeah. um our findings have not shown that trend in attitudes so although we do see kind of evidence in society of people thinking that people who own sex dolls are kind of a little bit strange maybe isolated maybe lonely um, we've done some work recently with a few of our postgraduate students looking at kind of what is the structure of people's attitudes. So at the moment, we, there's no scale that measures attitudes towards sex doll owners. Um, so we developed a scale using things like the ATS, so the Attitudes Towards Sex Offender Scale, things like Attitudes Towards Transgenderism, Attitudes Towards Mental Health, kind of try, trying to pull different attitudinal scales from different domains and making them fit the, the sex doll context. Um, so we, we administered a scale that in the end came to about 90, between 90 and 100 items. Um, and we did a factor analysis of that on data from about 500 people. And basically we found that people didn't see sex doll owners as being particularly dysfunctional. They didn't see them as being particularly dangerous. Um, and actually, they were relatively supportive of the idea that people, if they want to own sex dolls, should be allowed to own them. Um, obviously, there are caveats to that. We, we didn't specify what kind of sex doll uh, we were talking about. So whether we were um, talking about adult-like dolls or child-like dolls, I think there would be a, a huge difference um, if we were to specify the age of the doll. But just in general, um, people's attitudes aren't as negative as maybe you'd first think. And can I ask Craig, what kind of led you down to this particular research area? Uh, again, really good question. And I, I, whenever I get asked questions like that, I, I never really know how to respond. I just, <laughs> I quite like exploring topics that people just have an instinctive response to, um, especially when there's no data to support those instinctive responses. Um, so things like paedophilia, things like uh, sexual offending, things like sex dolls people tend to have these intuitive things that are no, they're bad, that we should ban them, uh, we should lock these people up, whereas actually there's, there's very little evidence to support that. So in uh, some of the stuff that Joe was talking about earlier in terms of profiles of people who own sex dolls, I think instinctively, if you look at the legislation that's coming out, people are talking about whether we should be banning them, whether we should be restricting access to them, um, because they could lead to harm further down the line, or they could lead to um, issues with attitudes towards women or offence supportive cognitions in relation to child sexual offending, for example. Um, we found that that's not the case, um, at least in our kind of initial preliminary kind of data. There's no association whatsoever with um, sexual aggression proclivity, for example. Um, we do see some evidence that people who own sex dolls are maybe more distrusting of women but they also have poorer quality past relationships. So it's not necessarily that sex dolls are causing these attitudes. It could be that people have these attitudes. They're not engaging in kind of normal relationships and they're using a sex doll as a surrogate for that relationship. Um, so for me, to, to kind of answer, go back to the question, it's, it's less about having a particular interest in this specific topic, I guess. And it's more about wanting to have an impact on kind of adding data to a social discussion that actually I think is really important in terms of people living healthy, happy sexual lives in a way that doesn't 
harm other people where actually if they weren't using these things if they weren't owning these dolls they maybe could be if they have um atypical sexual interests and there's kind of sexual attitudes that might be supportive of um sexual offending if they have a safe healthy sexual outlook that satisfies them and we can show that these things are not increasing harm then why shouldn't we be um looking into that as a potential safe sexual outlet for for different groups and have you seen any connection with incels then which obviously come out more to the fore recently about people who um feel it's sort of got those sorts of attitudes towards women so we we haven't done anything specifically with that group um i know they are a very difficult to reach group in terms of research um i was talking to someone actually a guy called william costello at a bps conference recently who's done work with incels um and to be honest the profile that he's starting to build of, of the incel psychology doesn't again doesn't map the social stereotype of who incels are um in fact they seem relatively sad i guess in terms of their mental health their, their mental well-being very low uh, sorry, high levels of loneliness, for example, low uh, levels of well-being, high anxiety, high depression. Um, so no, to, to answer the question, we haven't seen any association with that, but we haven't explicitly looked at it, to be honest. Mm. Uh, it's something that we could look at in the future, but we don't currently have plans to do that. So I wonder what the difference between sex dolls and sex bots was. So the key difference is the, the technology. So a sex doll in its kind of crude form is inanimate it's made of um, silicon uh, typically whereas the sex bots will, will be made of um, typically higher quality material but they'll also have some kind of AI built into them so they'll be able to uh, kind of rudimentally interact with their owner for example a lot of the newer models for example have got um, relatively advanced AI built into them in terms of they can respond to their owner they have certain modes that are pre-programmed but they can also learn um, from their experiences using this kind of machine learning algorithm so um yeah the key difference really is the uh, the technology as far as i'm i'm aware when we're talking about sex dolls and talking about your research are we talking about males using a female sex doll or females using a male sex doll typically talking about men who are using female like sex dolls so sex dolls that resemble uh, female bodies. The vast majority of items that are on the market are female resembling sex dolls. I, I had another question about your sample, actually. Um, was your sample non-offending? Was it kind of a general population? Did you use any offending samples within it? As I was really curious about whether or not sex dolls might potentially feed into a sexual preoccupation, which we know is linked with risk potentially for some people. So I was kind of curious about that, Craig, if you could share a little bit about your sample. Yeah, so the, the, the samples that we've recruited are from, from a very variety of different places. So the majority of the, um, the majority of the sex dolls that we've recruited are coming from forums that are online. So there are a, a few kind of very really high profile um, forums for people who own sex dolls that we've recruited from. Um, in terms of our public comparison sample, we've uh, recruited those from a crowdsourcing platform called Prolific. So you can basically pay people a little bit of money just to take part in a survey to give you a control sample. Um, but no, the, the samples of sex doll owners that we've had um, are not offending, um, or at least the, we haven't recruited them from, uh, from correctional kind of context, I guess. We haven't gone out and looked for people who have offended and own a sex doll. We've just looked at people who own a sex doll. Um, and then whether they have or haven't offended um, is kind of a, a question that we've we've explored a little bit. We're finding relatively low levels of offending, but again, it's self-reported. So, um, so whether or not we can really trust that data, we've tended to rely on proclivity data more than offending data. So uh, essentially with that data, you get, you give people a range of different scenarios and you say in this scenario, would you be sexually aroused? Would you do the same thing? Um, and would you enjoy kind of getting your own way? You then average the scores on those three items on a one to seven scale. It gives you an index of how likely somebody might potentially be to go on to commit um, sexual offences or to have a, an interest in offending behaviour. That's a really interesting algorithm. I've never heard of that as an algorithm of potential offending. 
I wondered, Craig, if you could share for our viewers what proclivity actually means. Um, you know, just just to kind of give an example of what that might mean and what that looks like. Yeah, so proclivity is um, it's kind of an analog for a, a risk measure. So, um, like I said, if if you have someone who is saying that they are highly aroused by an offending scenario, um, that they would probably do the same thing in that situation and they would enjoy getting their own way. Um, then we would infer that that person has a potential risk for future offending or they have an interest in offending. Um, I think in the sexual offending literature, there's a, a scale called the interest in child molestation scale. Um, it was put together by Teresa Gannon and Alicia O'Connor. Um, it seems to be used a lot to measure on the face of it. The, the papers that have used that tend to use that as a measure of prevalence of sexual interest in children. Um, but to me, that's it's more of an index of um, kind of an interest in offending rather than an interest in the group, if that makes sense. It's a very behaviorally grounded measure. It's about in that situation, would you do the same? How would you feel if you were doing that behavior rather than are you sexually aroused by this potential group? How have sex dolls developed in other countries? Um, so there's obviously different different countries have different laws um so for example in the uk it's not illegal to own a childlike doll in the uk it's illegal to import a childlike doll under uh postal laws so it's about importing an obscene item um whereas in uh, various different us states it's illegal to own uh dolls um, so Essentially, because the technology has grown so quickly, it's it's really difficult to see kind of how different countries are treating it because the, we're starting from a baseline of there's no legislation at all, and people are trying to kind of form legislation reactively because of what they think might be the kind of downstream effects of owning sex dolls. So it's a really difficult question to answer, to be honest, because there isn't uh, there isn't really any comparative data between different countries. Obviously in the Far East, um, where technology tends to kind of develop a little bit quicker, um, we do see slightly higher rates of these, um, of owning these dolls. Um, we also see, I think, slightly more permissive attitudes, at least from a social discussion perspective. We haven't done, um, maybe we should kind of run that study in terms of looking at attitudinal differences in different countries. That would be really interesting actually. Um, but we haven't got comparative data, to be honest. So it's, it's really difficult to answer what's going on internationally. It sounds like though you're doing some really groundbreaking work in, in many ways, if there isn't that comparative data, actually the UK kind of, you're leading that really, which is fantastic. We hope so, we hope so. And it's, like I say, what we see is that a lot of people are making suggestions about legislation because of what might happen as a result of of sex doll ownership. So we see a lot of philosophers, we see a lot of legal scholars talking about the potential for harm. And, and there's, a, there's a school of thought in legal scholarship called legal moralism. Um, and a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the discussions that are being had are within that school of thought. It's about what could happen as a result of owning sex dolls. Um, there's a couple of papers that are talking about um, robotic rape, for example. So literally equating having sex with a sex doll or a sex robot as being rape, um, which to me feels a little bit strange, um, to be honest. And when you think about the fact that um, these dolls are inanimate, I've had conversations, Jerry, you kind of alluded at the start to kind of Twitter discussions. I've had a few discussions on, on Twitter, one particular high profile one back in 2017, 2018, um, where it was talking about, well, so someone posted about a, a convention, a conference where a new sex doll was introduced and within a few hours, that model of sex doll was broken at the, at the conference because it was so used. Um, and this was being used as an example of how sex dolls cause harm to women. Now, I'm not for one moment saying that what happened in that situation was good um, or even that there isn't a potential harm for some people. But I think to say this happened in this one place, so therefore we should ban dolls, which was what the, the argument that I saw being made was, was being made. Um, 
I think it's a stretch to say that, particularly when at that time there was literally no data at all. There was no review of the evidence. There was no preliminary data. There was no theoretical model of what risk might look like. It was just pure emotion reacting to a, a single story um, and thinking about what the downstream effects might be. So yeah, I, I think if we can do something that is groundbreaking, kind of if we look at just providing some data, like what's actually going on, what's this, what, who are sex doll owners and what are their profiles in terms of their psychology, their personality? Are there certain members of that community that might be risky? If that is the case, then maybe we can think about regulation of that rather than a complete criminalization. Um, but I think for the vast majority of people, and this is what seems to be coming out on our data, for the vast majority of people who own sex dolls, there's no difference in their proclivity for offending to someone who doesn't own a sex doll. So if, if that doll is giving them happiness, if it's making them sexually satisfied, if they're not in a relationship, if they don't feel able to have a relationship with somebody, then, then who are we because we find it a little bit icky to ban them having something that is making them happy if that's not causing harm. And that for me is the important part. If there's no harm being caused, then who are we as people who don't own sex dolls to restrict access um, for those who, who might find that these are useful for them. And what's the research about how it impacts on relationships? Because I think from what I've heard in, um, I say China, where people um, just haven't seen sort of clip about it on television, they were saying, well, you know, why bother having a relationship? You know, I've got this doll, I'm, she fulfills all my needs. I talk to her in the evening, we have dinner together, and then we have sex and we don't need to go out and make relationships. And that sounded a very um, sort of... Um, a crude measure in a way of a few people's opinions um but have you done any research into how it does affect relationships so not directly no so we haven't looked at people who are in relationships we have tried actually to recruit people um who are in relationships with people who own sex dolls so kind of the partners of people mm -hmm. if anyone's watching the podcast who is in that situation then please do get in touch with us because we would love to speak to you um but no we haven't done anything that is um, that is directly looking at the effects of people who are in relationships at the moment. In the doll owner sample that we had, what we did find is that there were lower rates of people who are in relationships, much higher rates of things like divorce and separation, um, much higher rates of maybe seeing women as being unknowable. Um, so having these kind of um, strange relationships with women. And in quantum and qualitative data as well, we see that some of the sex doll owners are saying that the doll is almost like their perfect partner. So physically, they can design the doll how they want, they're kind of customizable models, but equally, they see deficits in themselves in terms of being able to interact with women, but also deficits in other people in terms of maybe feeling anxiety towards a partner, um, feeling like past partners have maybe put them down a lot, um, and you don't get that from the doll. So we do see some of that kind of narrative coming through in the data from doll owners. Um, but there's nothing that we've done at the moment looking at people who are in relationships and what their relationship is like um, as a result of having a doll. And I think we'd find it really difficult to run something that was meaningful um, on that purely because of the sample sizes. We, we spent kind of two and a half years recruiting uh, the sample that we have already got. And we've got about 150 people who own sex dolls. And if we start looking at people who were only people who are in a relationship, then the statistical power to really say anything meaningful really drops. So it's it's really difficult to do much in this area that is not correlational, looking at kind of kind of general relationships between different constructs. But it's something that we're trying to to expand. At the risk of sounding like an utter forensic psychologist, is there such a thing as a risk assessment for a sex doll? Like uh, someone who's committed, someone who has committed a sexual offence, could you risk assess whether or not it would be appropriate or not? Uh, not at the moment, no. no. So there would be nothing necessarily to say that that in and of itself is or is not a risk factor for future offending, no. Um, again, something that we would love to do in terms of um, kind of further down the line, I think this is maybe five, 10 years in the future, maybe running some kind of study if we can show in the community that these things are actually safe, um, then is there scope maybe for, for having dolls as part of a therapeutic plan? Um, 
um, and then evaluating that to see whether or not that is something that is positive or not. Um, but ultimately, it depends on what the, what the community data say. We, we're trying at the minute to get a study off the ground, looking longitudinally at people who are buying their first doll um, and then following them up over the course of the first year of their ownership to see what happens in terms of their offense supportive cognition, their well being, their attachment with the doll, um, their general levels of well being, their offense proclivity. Um, so, in the community, if we can show that there's nothing um untoward i guess if 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 it's just the case that people buy a doll and they live happily with that doll and it's kind of a source of sexual satisfaction for them there's no increase in risk then it gives us more of a grounding i guess to go to um go to those who are accrediting treatments and saying look we've got this data if you've got people who are sexually preoccupied maybe this could be a safe sexual outlet for them um I wouldn't want to say either way whether I think that that would be the case or not because I just don't know and I'm kind of going back to the idea of, of there not being any data I would rather sit on the fence a little bit I guess and and wait for that data to come in before making a, a forming some kind of preliminary conclusion than than say yes or no but I think it'd be something that would be interesting to explore uh, in the future. I've had conversations at work recently about using a sex doll as a therapeutic intervention but this idea of how would you measure it yes yeah it's very difficult um but it would be something that we would need to look at in terms of how do you actually design an assessment that would um that would really accurately i guess and objectively measure whether that is useful and, and to be honest i don't know what that looks like at the moment mm -hmm. When you do, please come back and tell us. <laughs> uh, absolutely, and, and we should have a chat in terms of what you think that might look like as well. It's really interesting that it does sound in some ways, and for some people it could be quite protective actually. Um, so I think in some ways it could be quite useful. To, and if you, got, if you got that study off the ground, it'd be amazing to, to find out actually how, how it could be supportive or not. Um, I did have a question kind of linking back to Jerry's question around relationships. Do we know anything about um, sex dolls and uh, the attachment styles of people who use them? Is there anything around that? Because what we know with offending populations is that a lot of them can have insecure attachments. And I was kind of quite curious about what that's like in people for people who use sex dolls. Uh, yes, yeah, so we did have that in our um, in our initial study. So we, we, we assumed that there would be higher levels of insecure attachment, particularly around um, maybe anxious attachment styles, so wanting to be attached to something and kind of keeping that close. But what we found was that although there were slightly lower levels of secure attachment among sex doll owners, that wasn't significantly different between doll owners and non-owners. So we didn't really see anything in terms of attachment style differentiating doll owners from, from non-owners. That would be interesting, though, in your forthgoing research to ask about how it impacts on people wanting to develop relationships and does that stop them wanting to because it's easier you know, and there isn't for the reasons you've said yeah. um, i think yeah. obviously it depends on where they where people start as well so it might be that at the end of a longitudinal study lots of people are saying that they don't want to have a relationship with a real person mm -hmm. but if they start with a similar kind of mindset then we can't say that that's really in relation to their doll mm -hmm. it's about the fact that maybe the doll has crystallized that view mm -hmm. But actually, it's about the doll then maybe meeting a need that they had at the beginning in terms of they wanted a an outlet for sexual um, their sexual arousal, and they've got it now. So therefore, they don't need to maybe seek out other relationships. So when we get to the end of that study, if it does say that um, that people are not willing or not wanting to have a relationship. We can't necessarily say that that's because they own a doll. It might be that they start at that point. And our, our data at the moment are suggesting that that might be the case. Um, much higher rates of people saying um, that they they have had that they, sorry that they have had much poorer quality relationships in the past. Look, like I say, much higher levels of divorce and separation among doll owners than non owners. So I think it, it depends on the baseline as well. We need to really consider that baseline rather than just what happens at the end. But I think. A lot of people, when they're making decisions about this topic, will see the end result and think, ah, we need to ban them because of this, mm -hmm. or this is a risk because, whereas actually they're not thinking about what was happening at the beginning. So mm -hmm. before people had a doll, 
what was their psychology at that point and if it's the same we can't say it's because of the dog mm. well possibly the same but they're happier in, in the, exactly. than they were at the beginning so then that would be even more reason to, to not say no to them so how do you see this progressing in the future what's the way forward with dolls do you think um, from a research perspective, we just need more data. So there's um, there's a few papers that are coming out recently. There was one published yesterday, actually, in the Journal of Sex Research, looking at um, anthropomorphization. So the way that people um, kind of attach human-like feelings or human-like traits to their doll. Um, I need to have a proper look at that paper to see what it's looking like. But it, I think there's a relationship between anthropomorphization and objectification. Whether that's objectification of a doll or of, or of women, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, there's lots of different research groups, I think, that are starting to look at this now. Um, like I say, we're trying to get a study off the ground at the minute that is more longitudinal. So at the moment, our, our papers, so we've got one paper looking at adult-like doll owners, one paper looking at child-like doll owners um, that are basically cross-sectional. So are there differences between people who own those dolls and people who don't? that's all well and good and we can say that there are or aren't differences but ultimately we can't make any causal argument as a result of those data so what we're trying to do at the minute and we're just hopefully um, going to be able to do this in the next kind of six months or so is to launch a study that tracks people from when they buy their first doll and follows them up at kind of three months six months nine months and 12 months um, to see over time when it's their first doll what happens to their levels of well-being, their levels of risk, their levels of attachment, their relationship attitudes, their attitudes towards women, their sexual behaviours, their sexual interests. Um, once we have that data, we can then start to make more concrete arguments, I guess, about whether these are healthy sexual outlets or whether they could be used potentially in therapy or um, whether kind of calls to criminalise or regulate their use are a sensible or if they're empirically grounded but at the moment we we're really limited in terms of what we can do so the more data that we have particularly around longitudinal studies the better because at that point we'll start to be able to make more um informed recommendations well send us a link to that and we can put it in the show notes um for people that watch the episode oh, so, i'd like to pass that on to somebody um, so what do you hope to do in the future? How do you see your future research going? More of the same, really. So we, um, we're we constantly looking at different topics. Um, so things that are kind of being discussed um, in the media, in society, that are kind of difficult, but again, that we don't have any data about. So like I say, the, the stuff that Rebecca's leading on, um, I'm involved in that quite a bit in terms of minor attraction and paedophilia the sex doll stuff is um is particularly interesting at the minute to me and kind of that's occupying a lot of my thinking in terms of how do we um how do we drive some of that forward can we get sex doll manufacturers involved in that can we get people who are involved in the industry to support that to kind of get that word out a little bit also looking at things around um attitudes towards these different um topics so we've done lots of stuff on attitudes towards paedophilia less work at the minute on attitudes towards sex dolls um, so we'd like to do more stuff on that in terms of validating that scale that I spoke about earlier uh, we're also doing some work looking at function so um, if you tell people that someone's got a sex doll for company does that change their opinion as, as compared to whether they're using it for sexual gratification versus if they're using it for um, I don't know a treatment for sexual dysfunction maybe um, so yeah, we, we've actually got one, one study that was quite interesting with a couple of our postgraduate students um, looking at the fact that sex robots are basically just um, Alexas inside a sex doll. So people have completely kind of normal views about Alexa as being something that just sits on their kitchen worktop and tells them the time and tells them when they need to get stuff out of the oven. But if you put that Alexa inside something that is... Uh, silicon and looks like a sexualized female body, then all of a sudden it becomes a problem. Um, and we're seeing that those kind of, how you present that technology seems to drive people's attitudes or change people's attitudes. So that's something that's really interesting in terms of, um, is it about the appearance of the sex doll or the function or an interaction of the two? We're kind of trying to get our head around what that 
the data actually means at the minute. So yeah, lots more stuff to come in terms of attitudes, um, ownership stuff, and kind of trying to marry the two things together as well. So sex dolls and uh, the paedophilia stuff, is there is there scope maybe to use or to look at sex dolls as a healthy sexual outlet for people who are attracted to children who aren't offending? And again, that is way down the road in terms of looking at making recommendations. But again, the, the data that we have at the moment in terms of childlike sex doll owners um, is very similar to the adult-like doll owners in terms of we're not seeing at this preliminary stage, any increase in risk among those who have sex dolls. Uh, so I think that's another one, another topic that is gonna be uh, interesting to look at, but quite difficult to talk about in terms of um, policy and, and recommendations. So we're trying to be really uh, careful at the moment in terms of how we frame some of the arguments in relation to that. We've just had that paper provisionally accepted at Archives of Sexual Behaviour. So that should be coming out in the next couple of months, I hope. Um, just need to do a couple of minor revisions, but we have had it accepted. So I'll, I'll let you let you see a copy of that when it when it comes out as well. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for joining us um, today, Craig. And it just remains for me to say, let's talk forensic psychology. Yeah.